Hello, my name is Megan, and I am a filmmaker, writer, and director. So what are the interconnected threads that bind these identities together? What are the lines that I interplay between? Stories. I'm a storyteller, and I'm interested in how stories shape the world we live in, and or how the world we live in shapes the stories that we tell. And more specifically, how if there are billions of people on this earth, alive and dead, how there are only a few universal story structures that we continue to tell to this day. And one in particular that is considered the gold standard of Hollywood, of books, of writing courses. And it's called The Hero's Journey. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. It was coined by Joseph Campbell in 1949 after he'd studied hundreds of thousands of years of myths and archetypes from all over the world. Now, it was a 17-step structure when he created it, and Christopher Vogler later turned it into 12 steps when he was working at Disney. And this is the structure that we use today. Now, even if you don't know all the steps by heart, I'm sure that you know it because they say it is ingrained in our cultural DNA. It's a tale as old as time. You have an ordinary man living an ordinary life, and one day he gets a call perhaps metaphorically, from God or within himself, to go on a journey, a quest. Now first, and this is important, he denies the call. He is, considers himself too small, or perhaps he doesn't believe he's a hero that he's meant to be. But of course, a mentor comes along to impart some wisdom on him, and then off the hero goes to his journey, he crosses the threshold, and when he gets into this magical new world, it's there that he meets tests and allies and mentors. Things get pretty tough for the hero. And it gets so tough, in fact, that he descends into the abyss or has a dark night of the soul. And right at the moment when you think all is lost, he's either died or metaphorically or in reality, he learns something and he rises above. And on the other side, he gets a reward. And then he heads back on his journey, back to the kingdom where he came from. But of course, there is a final test. Has this hero really learned his lesson? Is he truly the hero that we think he all is? So then he passes the test. And on his way back, he is now a master of two worlds and imparts the wisdom to the, the kingdom that he came from. So my question is, is this story structure that was coined by a white man in 1949, is it still considered universal? Can it still be universal? Or is it somehow keeping us stuck in the white supremacist, patriarchal, capitalist society that we live in? So let me tell you a story. <laughs> I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, United States of America. Uh, it's often known for the TV series The Wire or as you say in France, the wire. And it's much more than that, but we'll leave it there. I grew up to divorced parents. My mom was a, an administrative assistant. My dad was a Marine and later went into business. And I was kind of this quirky outsider kid who was enchanted by the magic of the world around me. And around five or six years old, I had this, what you could say, was a calling to be an actress. Now, um, I didn't come from a family of actors, but looking back, I realized that having a script in my hand helped me make sense of the chaos of the world around me. So years later, um, I didn't really know what I was gonna do with this acting career since we didn't come from a family of actors. I had a neighbor that came around and he told me that there was this acting school called Baltimore School for the Arts. It was considered one of the best arts high schools in the world. It boasts alumni like Jada Pinkett Smith or Tupac Shakur. So I auditioned, and I was one of 13 people to get in. There I met my chosen family, and I studied every structure you could imagine. Meisner Techniques, Stanislavski, The Method, Shakespeare, clowning. And at the age of 18, I starred in a really bad horror movie, and I thought, now I'm ready. I'm ready for Los Angeles. So I moved 3,500 miles away, alone, to Hollywood to be an actress. Now while I was there, I... I was poor, 
So to get by, I had to work lots of different jobs. I worked in casting, I worked as a personal assistant, I worked in waiting tables, all while studying and trying to be an actress, America. Um, and I tried to morph myself into every possible thing you could imagine as well. I dyed my hair brunette. Um, I was a curious blonde. I even turned myself into a spy. But for eight years, I only landed small roles here and there. And so I finally walked into my agent's office and I was like, look, what, what gives, you know? I haven't landed a job in like eight years. And he looked at me and he said, look, you're talented. You're good. But when you walk into the room, they see a white girl. And they called in a Lopez. Maybe think about changing your name. <laughs> so I looked at him and I said, I am Megan Adele Lopez. They can't see the blood of my Cuban gangster father coursing through my veins. End of my blonde-haired, blue-eyed mother from Baltimore. I am the embodiment of Scarface. Say hello to my little friend, I said, and I shot him in the face. No, I didn't really shoot him in the face. I don't believe in violence, but I did um, understand at that point that mixed race kids don't really fit into Hollywood structure. They don't really know what to do with us. And I got depressed because, I mean, for 20 years, my whole identity had been an actress. I didn't know what to do with myself. I started taking drugs, all kinds of drugs, bad ones, like um, crystal meth and cocaine. And, and I started drinking a lot and um, putting myself in compromising positions. And then one day I was driving home from this party because the guy wouldn't take no for an answer. And um, I fell asleep. And I woke up right as my car was going straight into the wall of the 405 freeway. Now, luckily nobody was injured, including me. My car was totaled, but um, I learned that at that moment, in order to be my own hero, I needed to step away and play it safe. And so I went a more traditional story and I got married and I went in marketing and I moved to Chicago. Now, of course, like most callings, um, they don't always go away. Mine happened to morph into writing. I realized that writing gave me the words that Hollywood wasn't willing to give me. And at first, I didn't want to have to do anything with any structures because I wanted some freedom. I had studied acting for so long. At this point, I just wanted to have fun. But of course, I'm ambitious and I'm a bit competitive. So I wanted to know how the big boys were doing it. And this is when I found The Hero's Journey. And I loved it. I mean, this, I was like, this isn't just a story structure. This is a way to live your life. This is a blueprint for how to get through the tough times. I use this journey sometimes to help me get out of bed, to um, have the courage to leave my abusive relationship. I use this journey to have the courage to apply to be the global digital business director of the New York Times. And I got the job and they moved me to Paris, where I now live. It also gave me the journey to leave that, gave me the courage to leave that job and to enter filmmaking. But of course, as I was reading voraciously about the hero's journey, I came across an interview by Joseph Campbell. And in this interview, Joseph Campbell said that he didn't believe women really could be a part of the hero's journey because we were born with the journey inside of us. We were the goal, he said. And that was creation, to become a mother. Now, as somebody who never wanted children of her own, I didn't take this very well. I was furious, I felt rejected. I realized, oh, okay, so this is what's happening. Basically, Hollywood and the movie industry, they're making heroes into sheroes, but women still don't really exist in this world. So I started looking for, for new structures, and that's when I came across The Virgin's Promise by Kim Hudson and The Heroine's Journey by Maureen Murdoch, who had studied under Joseph Campbell. I mean, these were, these were good. They, were, they took into account the women's journey, but they still felt like they were trapping us in this patriarchal structure. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna try and write my own structure. And I'm gonna do it in the form of a young adult feminist fantasy novel, because obviously it can't be in this world that we live in. Set it in the future, and I did it with this girl named Isla, who was a protagonist. 
and I was going to make her into the sacred goddess. She would embody everything that there was to be a female. She would be allowed to feel all of her feelings, and she would not be a strong, independent woman. And she would still lead a revolution. For six years, I wrote this. I toiled, I wrote it 100,000 words three times while working full time at the New York Times. And I failed. <laughs> I failed miserably. I just, I couldn't figure out how to write outside of the structure. It was like, I felt like I was trapped inside this patriarchal world where they had turned the room temperature to freezing cold and even my imagination couldn't get me out of it. You know, they tell you to study the geniuses before you, before you even think about writing the future or breaking free from it. But if the geniuses before you didn't care about you or, or you didn't exist in their world, then why should I care about what they have to say about me? And that's when I realized it. I shouldn't have to care what they have to say. Just because at one point in Joseph Campbell's career, he believed these old fashioned beliefs of the way the world worked didn't mean that the structure that he had unearthed, that was universal, that had universal truths about what it meant to be human, wasn't of me. You know, I, um, Hollywood and, and novels, they've all had biases ingrained in them for years. And the, the rebel archetype in me wants to burn it all down. It really does. But the wise old crone archetype knows that in order to really, to really change the world, we need to transform the energy, transcend it. The story structure itself was neutral. It's like, it's like money. Money is neutral. It's just what we do with the money, how we spend it, what we spend it on, whose hands it gets into that makes it seem like money is intrinsically evil. So with this newfound knowledge, I went back to Isla, uh, my protagonist, and I thought, you know what? I am going to use a hero's journey. And I'm going to turn in Isla not just into the sacred goddess, but to the sacred everything. She will be born not just from the fire, but from the water. And I created a new kind of human called the Haleen, who are too complex, too mixed, too daunting, were killed off for hundreds of years until Isla came around and learned how to integrate all parts of herself to lead the world to a new vision of itself. We can't be so angry at the world that we don't see the gifts that it gives us. I mean, we can be angry at the world, but we can't let that stop us from seeing the gifts. Stories help us not just see our past, but also help us to prophesize and imagine our futures. To create a new world, we don't yet need to change the transformational structures of our ancestors. We need different people with different beliefs, different stories, different mentors, different allies, different struggles to come forward to become their type of hero. Now with Isla, I was able to tell my story through her, and she's in good hands right now with a literary agent who's out shopping it around to publishers. You know, despite of and because of how the world is today, I need to believe in heroes. And I'm looking forward to the different heroes that arise. Thank you. <laughs>